Uh, hello, my name is Lowell, pronouns he, him, and this is another one in a series of talks, seminars we've done uh, here in the community on different games and different topics. Last year, we did a seminar on hard moves and hard choices, bargains. Uh, we did another one on running mysteries. We did another one on running Legacy Life Among the Ruins talking about that. And just recently, I covered my own game, Hearts of Wulin, in one of these seminars. Uh, I wanted to talk about Gumshoe uh, today because it's a, a game I have a, a long history with, a back and forth uh, about. And I know that there's been some talk in our community about like what's involved with it, you know, where where is it useful? Where is it not? What is it like? So I wanted to kind of do a discussion uh, of that. I'm hoping to talk for at most an hour, uh, probably less than that, uh, and then open it up to questions, to discussion. If we have people who've played Gumshoe uh, in the, 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 the group who's here on the Zoom today, uh, I welcome your feedback, uh, uh, input, experience on these things to help people who might be looking at gumshoe, the gumshoe system as a whole, and trying to figure out what it's about, what they need to know, and where they're going to uh, start. So I want to talk a little bit about the history of gumshoe, why it exists, where it comes from. It uh, originally starts from the idea that we can build a set of uh, elements within the rules that are a solution to the mystery stopper problem, to the issue that people go to look for clues, they make a roll, they fail the roll, the, the uh, system shuts down. Uh, the fact that that happens and that for most GMs, they do a workaround, they fudge it, uh, or, or they hit that and they don't know what to do. Uh, it's a question of, do we have a set of mechanics for approaching it in the rules. Do we have a system for doing that? Uh, or do we just rely on the GM to, to fudge it? Now, Gumshoe came out uh, in 2006, and uh, uh, one of the criticisms that eventually evolved from people were, well, this is a solved problem. You know, people don't really do this. Don't worry about this. You know, this is not, not something that, that we need to build a system around. I want to say I absolutely disagree with that because it is not a solved problem because uh, you will see recurring on threads for people playing D&D, &D, uh, Pathfinder, uh, people coming in from trad games asking what they do when they hit situations like that, where they hit investigation things and they get that, that clue hammer, that door that is shut for them. Uh, so I do think that that there exists a space for Gumshoe uh, to take those ideas into broader RPGs, but also for Gumshoe to exist itself uh, as, as a system. I think it's important to think about Gumshoe as a game that is very much about, like at its heart, it is about mysteries, solving mysteries, working through clues with mysteries, uh, and mysteries being writ large as, you know, a murder, a crime, but also as a problem that needs to be solved. There is a situation, we need to get details, we need to put the facts together to be able to, to fix that situation. Uh, that that purpose of the game is really the engine that drives it. Like that is the play cycle at the table. Uh, uh, it is less a game that is about doing role-playing and from time to time we hit mysteries. Uh, it it is it is sort of that mystery that solving that problem solving uh, uh, discovery solutions all of that are very much uh, forward in this. Uh, I have been back and forth on Gumshoe uh, since it came out in two thousand and six. Uh, I've backed most of the Kickstarters. I've picked up a, a lot of it. Uh, I've run Ash and Stars. I've run Mutant City Blues. I've run uh, Esoterrorists. I've run uh, Fall of Delta Green. I've run Trail of Cthulhu. I've run Bubblegum Shoe. I've run a lot of different versions of this, and I've hacked some, and I've tried to figure out, and I've, I've, I've 
been uncertain about gumshoe from time to time and I've come back to it. And I think I'm in the mode now where there is a lot that I appreciate about what it does as a system. And, and I've really come to appreciate the, the, the simplicity of the mechanics and uh, what you can get out of it. So uh, I want to talk about first the like main engine of gumshoe. So how does gumshoe work? Uh, gumshoe works primarily with our characters having uh, and being defined by two sets of abilities. Uh, and the, uh, those are investigative abilities and general abilities. You may hear me say skills from time to time because that in my brain is always what these are, but they are called abilities in the game. And you've got two parallel tracks of these and they function quite differently from one another. Uh, now, there are other details that go into this. Uh, Trail of Cthulhu has drives and pillars of stability. We've got a cyberware in Ash and Stars. Uh, we've got the, the superpower matrix in Mutant City Blues. Those are all things that are in there. Uh, uh, but primarily, our characters are defined by the points that we have in those investigative abilities and the points we have in those general abilities. So it is very much a skill list system. Uh, so if you think of basic role-playing uh, from Call of Cthulhu, uh, GURPS, uh, those things that rely on uh, skill lists to be the, the center point, uh, but this doesn't even have stats. We don't even have uh, attributes or stats or characteristics. So the heart of things, is the investigative abilities. Uh, these are generally broken into three categories in almost all the games. What these categories are called can vary, uh, but it's generally academic, interpersonal, and technical. And uh, there can be uh, a lot of skills or uh, fewer skills. Uh, Swords of the Serpentine, the most recent version, which is our fantasy version of Gumshoe, uh, has only 24 skills. That's still a lot, uh, but it's it's less than something like the 38 of Trail of Cthulhu or uh, Ash and Stars has just a, a large, large number of, of skills to cover all the bases for it being a sci-fi game. Uh, uh, but that kind of defines what the focus is. You'll see some skills reappearing from time to time, getting re- written in certain ways, uh, depending on, on the genre. It's one of the places where the tweaks happen if you want to change gumshoe to work with a particular genre. That's where the first set of tweaks occur is there with those investigative abilities. Now, most of the time, investigative abilities are going to be rated from one to three. Sometimes people will invest heavily and they might have more than that. Uh, but one point is enough. Uh, one of the things that the game uh, uh, tries to make clear to players when they go to buy an investigative ability is if you have a point in a, any investigative ability, you are competent in it. You are competent in forensics. You are competent at talking with uh, cops. You are very, very good at that, and you can use that fairly freely. Having more points in an ability means that in play, you're going to have more chance to call on that ability to uh, get spotlight time or to investigate more deeply uh, into things. Uh, and uh, one of the things that Gumshoe does is it actually calculates the build points for characters based on the number of players, which uh, can be a uh, uh, an issue if you have a variable number of players in your game or a changing cast or things like that. Uh, but they have a number of points that are set uh, and they encourage players to look at each other's characters and uh, try to cover all the bases so that that like every one of the investigative abilities, somebody has at least one point in. So one of the places where playing Gumshoe online uh, is actually easier, I think, than playing it face-to-face. -face. Uh, when we play Gumshoe in our Trail of Cthulhu game, uh, we have all the characters on one tab. They're next to each other. 
people can look and see what each other have and kind of point directions or lean into that uh, as it goes on. If you have a point in a skill and uh, say, Sarah says already, uh, a point in investigative ability, and you go into a situation where there is what is called a core clue, uh, then the GM uh, can point out that you have that ability so you can find that out, or they may uh, like go around the table and ask if anybody has a particular ability, or they may allow players to kind of free form that. But uh, like if you're looking at uh, a piece of art and the core clue is, uh, you know, some sort of, of uh, element of the frame, you know, if somebody has art or art history, then they will get the core clue uh, to spot the nature of like a, a hidden message or a reference or something like that that is present in that uh, without having to make a spend. I'm using the term core clue because it's one of the sort of the key factors in here. Uh, a core clue is a clue that players get that point to another location, person, scene. Essentially, it's the core clue is what says this is where you need to go to next. And uh, a lot of the mystery structure for gumshoe games are built around that framework of those core clues. And then uh, outside of that, uh, there are clues that deepen the player's understanding of what's going on. They create more context. They reveal more depth. They maybe point uh, to a, a non-vital resource, another person they can go and talk to, but that may add additional information in. Uh, those uh, are the, the sort of the backbone of this. As you're going along, you're investigating to kind of follow the, the path of clues and connections, but you're also trying to get the bigger picture out of this. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, how Monster of the Week operates, where part of the purpose of the, the clue finding there is figuring out like what the monster's vulnerability is. It's another kind of set of information that, that players gather through the use of these abilities. Uh, now, the big thing with those investigative abilities and the, the finding of the context clues and the, the sort of the non-core clues is that uh, if you want to get further information on a topic, if well, we're doing that uh, art history frame thing, the GM might say, would you like to make after they've got the core clue there, would you like to make an art history spend? Would you like to spend a point from that art history pool? Uh, the GM might make that as an offer or the player might ask if they could make a spend and they could get further contextual information uh, about the source, uh, about maybe how it was made, those kinds of things. Uh, so there's finding the core clues and there are is doing the spends to get further information. I will say that's the tricky part of Gumshoe is figuring out how much is a GM you want to be proactive saying, do you want to make X kind of spend and how much you want to have the players looking at the situation, looking at their skills and saying, can I make X spend? That is really where uh, the challenge is of, of running Gumshoe. And it's something that you pick up over time. One of the ways that uh, the designers talk about those investigative spends is they are about spotlight. So uh, if you want to show off that your character knows something, if you want to show off that your character is good at talking to cops, or you want to show, it that, show off that your character is good at chemistry, spends are a moment to get that spotlight, to show that character's depth of information, and uh, make it clear how cool your character is. Uh, and I think that's an important way to, to think about that. So that's on one side, our investigative abilities. Uh, and I, I know for some of you, I am treading over material that you're aware of that you know. I just want to get these basics out there. The other side of the thing uh, are general abilities. And general abilities are 
places where when we go to roll uh, or when we go to do something, we're making a roll, we're making a test. Uh, it is a place where there is risk, where there is question, where there is uncertainty. Like most uh, uh, good games, we don't roll unless uh, the moment is important, that it has a potential risk to the player. It has a potential impact on the game state. Uh, but uh, rolling in gumshoe is very simple. It's so simple that I disliked it for a very long time uh, because it is just 1d6. Uh, and I couldn't get my head uh, around that for a while uh, uh, until I played it more and I got used to how it mechanically works. Uh, you have, with your general abilities, a larger pool of things, a larger pool of points. You have uh, abilities like athletics, like fleeing, like melee. These are the action abilities. Uh, generally, when you go to make a roll, you make a, a decision of how many points you want to spend. You can spend none, or you can spend as many as you want. Generally, difficulty is four. So uh, if a difficulty is set at four and you spend three points, you're going to make the roll. You roll a one plus three, and you get that four. Uh, so there is the opportunity for players to, you know, set and be guaranteed about success. Some of the versions of Gumshoe, uh, 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 especially the early ones, uh, suggest that you don't tell the players the difficulty number. Uh, later ones, uh, I think, are a little more flexible about that, and that's one of the the sort of the the ways that you can be more or less adversarial between yourself as the GM and the players. My tendency when I run is to tell people the difficulty number. Uh, uh, just That's just my habit of things. With gumshoe, results are binary. So you either make a roll or, or fail the roll. If you fail the roll, there are sort of a, a general set of things discussed in gumshoe that you can allow the player to succeed but with a cost, uh, a, a reduced effect, damage, uh, causes an unintended consequence, that kind of thing. But generally, the gumshoe general skills are presented as binaries. Uh, one of the places where uh, it can get real challenging is that uh, uh, the uh, for fighting for monsters and things like that. They have pools. The NPCs have pools that they track and they make spends to attack or to dodge, things like that, uh, which means as a GM, you have to be calculating those pools. You have to be tracking those. You roll those. Generally, I roll those before the player does so they know how much they want to spend. Uh, uh, so that's uh, imp uh, important to know. Uh, there are in later gumshoe versions, uh, some rules for extraordinary success, uh, particularly Swords of the Serpentine really leans into this idea that if you roll, uh, I think it's a, a, a four higher than your target number, there is a benefit you get. And that's a house rule that has been flying around for a while for Trail of Cthulhu and other things. That, that the game has adapted over time. This idea that you can get critical successes and they can do more. Generally, when I run Trail of Cthulhu, even though it's not in the rules, I do use a house rule about extraordinary success. There are some mechanics in some of the games for modifying a roll after you make it uh, or re-rolling, but those are fairly uh, a few and far between. Uh, so most of the time, it's it's that pool of points that you have that you're spending from and uh, spending down. Uh, there are a few general skills that change up play. Uh, the tracks for damage are general abilities. Uh, so in the case of Trail of Cthulhu, that is uh, health and stability. Uh, there's physical and mental stress in Swords of the Serpentine. It is a pool of points that is your, your hit points or your mental stress or so on. Uh, and it can actually go below zero. 
Uh, and the more it goes below zero in several different brackets, the bigger the effect of it. Uh, it is one of the mechanics that takes players a bit to get used to because they are used to, okay, I hit zero, I'm obviously out, but that's not the case here. Uh, and there are roles quite often, uh, especially with stability mechanics or mental stress or things like that, where you're making a test to resist that damage. So let's say Trail of Cthulhu, uh, you have a difficulty four test on your stability. Uh, and if you don't make it, you're going to lose, the gym will tell you, three points. Well, at that point, there's a mathematical calculation uh, about how many points you want to spend because you could just spend three points and uh, uh, be successful at it. Uh, or you could could take a, a risk and spend nothing and see 50-50 if we get it. Uh, uh, or you could spend some points to be certain about it. Uh, uh, it is one of the places where the sort of the min-maxing calculation side of play uh, comes in. Now, those are like the real basics of, of what goes on in Gumshoe, but uh, there are some things that have evolved and changed in systems uh, over time. Uh, this idea of critical hits I mentioned as a house rule that has come up, that has evolved, that people have, have uh, gravitated towards uh, uh, different rules for handling things like automatic weapons fire uh, and explosions. Those have, have occurred. Uh, 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 Knights Black Agents is, I would say, the most mechanically dense and uh, complicated of uh, the, the gumshoe systems. It has a set of additional options, especially for the general abilities, where if you have a rating in a general ability of a certain threshold, you get a benefit, you get a, a cherry, uh, a, a thing that you can do with it, a special ability. Uh, sometimes there are uh, uh, ways to do a refresh for your points in the middle of uh, a mission based on those. Uh, uh, and as I said, there are lots of different mechanical adaptations that have occurred uh, that include other elements. And then on uh, the other side of that, there are a set of new games uh, uh, that includes uh, the, the Yellow King and the Gumshoe one-on-one -on -one and the second edition of Mutant City Blues that move away from uh, uh, investigative skills having individual ratings, but instead people knowing things and being able to make what they call pushes from uh, a, a more general pool of investigative uh, power uh, based on the things that they know. That's another big change. But the other thing that I think is really important for GMs and players to be aware of and to think about and as a GM decide how much you want to lean into this is something that uh, Swords of the Serpentine, for example, uh, really utilizes in an interesting way. So uh, there is a relationship between our investigative skills and our general skills. And uh, there is the idea that, especially in early games, that if you have an appropriate investigative ability, uh, like chemistry, let's say, and you want to use it to certain effect, like if you have demolitions, uh, you could spend a point from your chemistry investigative ability and get three points of a pool towards that demolition skill that you could then spend for a role there. And that's generally been the back and forth is one investigative uh, ability point is worth three general. Now that may vary. Early Trail of Cthulhu actually kind of reads things one for one in terms of build points and so on. But, but one of the other ideas that is related to that is, okay, so we can use our investigative abilities to boost general abilities. But the other idea is that you can use those investigative abilities to do additional things. You can use it to 
uh, let's say, use an interpersonal ability and a spend from that to make a friend. Uh, uh, if we want to spend reassurance and spend a point from that and say, okay, this person now, now trusts you. Uh, if we want to make spends to do uh, other abilities, uh, and again, I'm pointing back to Swords of the Serpentine, like uh, if something is appropriate, make an investigative spend that allows you to get an extra die of damage or to resist some kinds of damage. Uh, and uh, there's been a new thing of having like a lot more of the kind of special talents, special things that can be done to make those investigative abilities not just about, okay, we're an investigative scene, uh, I'll make a spend, I'll get information, but that you could do other things with them. I think it's great. I, I think it's really exciting. It's a really interesting, creative set of tools that you give the players once you open that up. I do think that as a GM, you need to kind of define like, what does that look like? What are the, the baselines? Like how powerful effect is it? How loose can I be in using that pool? Uh, and so on. But it's it's one of the, the modern adaptations and I think it's it's really important. Uh, I've talked about the idea of the core clues, uh, the cycle of play. Uh, generally, it is players starting at an inciting incident or being given a briefing, deciding how they want to move via the, the core information that they have there to different scenes, uh, going there, getting the core clue, deciding how much more they want to do in terms of investigations and spends for uh, uh, other materials uh, to, to deepen that context, and also then possibly uh, the chance of making preparations uh, via general skills or combating or clashing or conflicting with certain forces that might also require a fight or social conflict or something along uh, those lines. Uh, most of the time, uh, gumshoe cases are multi-session affairs. Uh, I would say with a few exceptions where you've got like a, a, a very deliberately built one shot, uh, the structure as presented in the modules, uh, as presented in the book, is we're going to be doing this over several sessions. Uh, and with that, uh, you're probably not going to get back uh, your general abilities or investigative abilities until we get to the end of that investigation. That's a really, really challenging thing as a GM. Uh, and uh, here's where I want to kind of talk a, a little bit more loosely about uh, the, the play style. Uh, the, there is an economy to gumshoe games. Uh, ideally, as a GM, you want to, over time, be taxing those resources. You want to be drawing out their general ability points and their investigative ability points. Uh, on the side of general ability points, you want to be putting some pressure on them to uh, you know, decide you know, how much they want to risk. Uh, how much they're they're willing to to take damage, what they're going to do on that side. Do they have the resources to heal themselves in the moment? You want to put pressure on them uh, that way. On the investigative side, we're going to be taking away those investigative points. They're always going to be able to get the core clues, but it's about whether they can go and get deeper information and uh, forcing them to think about creative uses for those investigative abilities. If I'm out of my interpersonal skills, if I've if I've burned through all of my interpersonal ability points, do I need to go bring another person into the scene to if I really want to to get more information out of a person? Or are there technical or academic skills maybe that this person has a background with that I could spend to like say, oh, well, I see that you're a, a, an interest in astronomy and draw them out that way. We want to be pressing on that. Uh, 
And getting used to how many points get spent in a session, uh, how many points get spent in a case is uh, an art uh, rather than a craft. I, I'm i always thinking about that, like trying to, to press on that when we're playing. I don't want to necessarily put people in a corner, uh, but I definitely want them to feel like, oh, this is tough. These are tough decisions that we have to make. Uh, and uh, that I really think is, is the, the, the hardest uh, part probably of, of managing a long gumshoe case, managing a long gumshoe set of scenes. Uh, uh, and I get it wrong sometimes uh, where people walk away and they really haven't spent anything uh, or I get it wrong where they are are really taxed and I've run them down to to zero in a way that that kind of feels possibly possibly unfair. Uh, uh, it probably isn't because they've got lots of resources. They just uh, you know complain when they don't have them. Uh, this is another place where, as a GM, running online with Gumshoe uh, can be a real advantage if you're using a. Uh, a character keeper where you can look and see all the character's abilities. You can scroll through that. Uh, the players are generally tracking that and updating that in real time so you can see what people have. You can lean into those. You can point the play in a particular direction. It's harder if you're only seeing one person's character sheet uh, or, or you're working from an investigative matrix where you've just got recorded uh, at the start uh, what people's abilities are and things like that. Uh, it's it's a challenge. The other thing that is a challenge is that it, is this idea of health and stability, uh, how much damage uh, players can take, what the costs and consequences are. Uh, I I I it has taken me a while to get used to uh, the the damage ratings uh, because. They can be quite variable across player characters, uh, and uh, damage can be very, very low, or, or it can be very, very high. Again, it's a very swingy 1d6. Uh, generally, 1d6 minus 1 or plus 1 is about the range of damage, so uh, we're talking uh, from 0 to 7, depending on, uh, on that. Uh, and... Uh, it's important as a GM, I think, to go a little higher with that because you can go below zero. Uh, I uh, I didn't quite get that for the longest time, and I would play the number of campaigns where players never hit zero on these things because in my mind, I was like, okay, zero is the, the real turnstone moment when it's not. Uh, uh, getting to that zero to minus five uh, players can get into that range. They can come back from that. Yet, yeah, sort of when it's below that, that minus six and below that, that there starts to be some real problems and potential long-term consequences uh, for players. One of the other challenges as a GM for running Gumshoe is when you do have a mystery setup and players have unusual investigative abilities, you want to give players a chance to use those. Uh, uh, you should keep an eye on what skills, uh, sorry, what abilities you tend to go back to the well on. Uh, I, I will say I often find that I'm leaning further into interpersonal abilities, the skills that are used to talk to other people, over kind of the hard academic and technical skills. And I I try to deliberately pull that back and make sure that I give more opportunities for those academic and technical skills. But part of the thing is there is an improvisational level for you as a GM. If somebody comes into a scene and they say, can I use X ability? Uh, now as a GM, we're trained sort of in the, the the modern era of the yes and, and I think that that should be our go-to. If we can figure out a way that that investigative ability can be used, it's worth it imp improvising, uh, uh, drawing in details maybe from elsewhere, 
uh, uh, maybe later scenes or so on to to deepen that moment. Uh, but sometimes we have to say no, but uh, no, it doesn't work here, but maybe it applies somewhere else, or maybe I can point you to another investigative ability that you have. You need to kind of be ready for that. I think uh, it's important to be very flexible about that uh, uh, because uh, what we don't want is a guessing game where the players are just trying to guess like what they should be asking for. They're trying to guess what they need to do. We need to give them permission to, to find cool approaches, uh, to engage with the mystery in uh, 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 a, a different way. I think that's, that's really important. Um, in regard to that, uh, I am a story gamer. I'm a, a Powered by the Apocalypse gamer. Uh, I come from uh, old trad games, but I have changed my tactic and I've very much shifted to that. Uh, and one thing that that means is uh, I, I think I tend to let things breathe a little more within scenes. Uh, uh, and uh, things take maybe a little bit longer than they might otherwise. Uh, it also means that mechanically I might be making fewer rolls or getting fewer spends than are expected from published materials. Uh, uh, a lot of the gumshoe things, uh, modules, adventures, and things like that are written, are written, I would say, with a, a slightly more trad approach to that. Uh, uh, approach to how many roles we're doing, uh, how many uh, elements we have going on in a thing. Uh, I have found that uh, as a person uh, taking published uh, uh, modules uh, like Knights Black Agents uh, uh, or Mutant City Blues, my first step is to read through the module, to look at it, and to see what I can cut like figuring out what are the really important or interesting uh, like core clues, segments, scenes, and things like that. Uh, a lot of the modules have a lot of uh, additional directions and things like that that are, can be super cool and really interesting and have in your back pocket. Uh, but I think one of the things that that I do uh, in, when I approach those adventures is is looking at a through line uh, and cutting those things down. Uh, I, there is a collection of Trail of Cthulhu adventures that is really, really excellent called uh, Arkham Detective Stories. They're really solid uh, 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 adventures, but they have a lot of stuff in them. And when you go to read through them, you can see there's actually a, like an easier, simpler through line. And... Uh, I think it's worth uh, uh, looking and cutting and focusing uh, that in. Uh, let me take a slug of this tea with honey. Then I'm going to answer Vince's question. Uh, and then I want to talk just a little bit about the different kinds of games and maybe a few other things. And then I want to open it up for people's feedback, questions, that kind of thing. So Vince asks, uh, it sounds like you're recommending an airing on the side of aggressiveness. Uh, that is part of the tension of the game. Yeah, I think that as I've played, uh, as I've run more gumshoe, I have dialed up my aggressiveness on the amount of stability hits, uh, the amount of uh, uh, damage, th those kinds of things. Uh, uh, and that that's felt better, felt tighter. Uh, I haven't hit a situation with that where I felt like I've kind of gone over the edge where uh, like uh, we've hit them with too much. Uh, but uh, that is that is kind of, again, uh, a piece of art. I think it is better to kind of err on aggressiveness at the start and then dial it back if you're finding that that is, is uh, too much. Uh, I tend to go to uh, look at existing materials, existing modules that we have. Uh, for example, before we start recording, we're talking about the Persephone Extraction, which is a Knights Black Agents campaign module. Uh, I tend to go to those first and look around 
and uh, try and figure out, you know, what is interesting, what I what I can take from those. But I also will write my own uh, uh, adventures as well, uh, uh, and uh, that is uh, something that requires uh, some prep work. When I ran uh, a modern Delta Green campaign uh, using the Fall of Delta Green rules last year or the the year before, uh, that that was a set of prep. Uh, and uh, coming up with the mystery and writing it out and getting it sketched out, that is very different than the kinds of prep and work that I do for Power by the Apocalypse games. It's effort. Uh, uh, it takes time to think about. I, you know, There's still room for improvisation in there, but there's a lot of getting those pieces in place. I talk more about that and what's involved in doing that kind of planned mystery building in uh, that talk I gave on running mystery scenarios. And I recommend... Uh, people can check that out. Uh, let me talk just briefly about uh, some of the the different games, uh, why why I really like them, uh, what I think is really important. Uh, I think right now the face of Gumshoe is Trail of Cthulhu. Uh, I think it's a really solid adaptation of of Call of Cthulhu. Uh, it uses some of the classic Call of Cthulhu mechanics like sanity, which uh, you may not be down with. Uh, and you may want to think about how you want to uh, rework that. One of the really exciting things that I think sometimes people don't talk about with Trail of Cthulhu is that rather than the 1920 setting, it's focused on that 1930s setting this is after you know uh the 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 big uh financial collapses people are starting to get back together but we have a rising tide of fascism we have some really interesting technological developments that have occurred it's it's a great period uh to to work with and i think that that trail has some exciting uh uh, things to go with that. There are are some modules that are set in very distinct uh, historical and geographical uh, places for Trail of Cthulhu that are very much one shots. They are very much built for that rather than being uh, able to uh, bring them into a campaign. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there are some great Trail of Cthulhu uh, adventures and modules out there. Uh, I mentioned Arkham Detective Stories. I would also recommend uh, Shadows Over Filmland if you're not looking for a Cthulhu, uh, uh, strictly Cthulhu game, Lovecraftian game. Shadows Over Filmland takes the sort of 1920s, 30s, 40s uh, black and white horror films, the things of Val Luton and others, and provide scenarios that are inspired by them. They are great starters. Some of those scenarios are really great and, and very adaptable to other situations. Uh, I'd also say that uh, the Armitage Files is a really interesting approach. Uh, it is a book of player-facing documents that you give to the players uh, that are uh, documents that are kind of coming back in time uh, the players have to figure them out and be, you create an improvisational campaign. The Dracula dossier later on takes that idea that the Armitage Files has and expands on that. Uh, and then, of course, I'm running right now uh, Fearful Symmetries, which is Steve Dempsey's uh, campaign of magicians in interwar Britain, uh, which is great, is really interesting, really fun, very non-Cthulhu, but there's some some hints of it uh, as a lot of, of neat material that you don't see other places. The other biggie, of course, is Nice Black Agents. Uh, nice Black Agents is a game that the, the tagline is Jason Bourne versus Vampires. I, I know all of you are familiar with it. Uh, I've run uh, uh, quite a bit of it. Uh, I've enjoyed it. There are spectacular resources for it. Uh, the Zelazny Quartet and the Persephone Extraction are both both great uh, uh, campaign series. The Dracula Dossier 
is a behemoth. Uh, it is a big book. Uh, it has a player facing document in the form of the annotated Bram Stoker's Dracula, which I found is can be a real challenge uh, to use, especially online. But there are some other materials that are out there for it. Uh, I would say it and all of the resource things are great pieces that you could build an amazing campaign out of. The one thing is with Knights Black Agents is you need to uh, uh, like temper players' expectations about what it is uh, because Knights Black Agents, while it has spies and espionage and chases and, and all kinds of rules and things like that, uh, it is at the heart a, a procedural investigation. Uh, a procedural mystery where you're gathering clues, you're trying to figure out where to go next, you're trying to to put the pieces together. Uh, I would say uh, it definitely is a little more La Carre than 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 James Bond. Uh, uh, Robin Laws did an analysis of Doctor No and pointed out that Bond is a terrible, terrible investigator. In Doctor No, is not good. Uh, uh, and so you do have a lot of that. And if a player comes in very much expecting constant frenetic action, uh, uh, you know, uh, fights, things like that. We can give them some of that, but they also have to be ready for those moments when the players are going and talking to contacts. They're, they're tracking down people. They're, they're looking at a site. They're, they're figuring things out. They're doing surveillance. Uh, and so uh, I do think that that Jason Bourne versus vampires is it sounds cool, but it also can can mislead people about what the 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 game is. I I had that when I ran uh, Nice Black Agents. I had one player who who had very different expectations about what they wanted the, the game to be, and that was a challenge trying to to serve their needs. Even as I had a set of other players who were very into putting a mirror board together and getting the graphs and drawing the lines from points to points uh, for people. Uh, a couple other games that I want to call out that are interesting. Uh, I mean, I could, I could certainly talk about my thoughts on Ash and Stars or Mutant City Blues uh, or the Gay and Reach, but I want to point out uh, uh, two ones that I think are really important. I think Swords of the Serpentine by Kevin Culp and uh, Emily Dressner uh, is doing really exciting things with Gumshoe. If you play gumshoe and you like it and uh you're, you're thinking about how you can tweak it how you can develop it i think that sorts of the serpentine has a lot of great ideas in it and a lot of tools that could be repurposed elsewhere like how they handle magic in there uh i think it's a really uh solid solid game uh, uh and i've run that and and enjoyed that the other one that i want to point out is a bubblegum shoe. Now, bubblegum shoe doesn't come from Pelgrane, but instead uh, was released by uh, Evil Hat. Uh, and Emily Care Boss and someone else who, whose name escapes me right now were the leads uh, on that. And Ken Height also helped with the development of it. And it's a slightly slimmed down version of Gumshoe focused on uh, sort of Veronica Mars style investigations that sort of teen detective it was actually written and came out before we got things like riverdale being really uh, exciting and these more mis recent nancy drew mysteries and things uh and it's a really cool set uh it's a game that gets sadly overlooked i think uh because it has a really fun adaptable set of ideas uh, uh particularly how uh, you can do specialties by talking to people and building up a relationship with them. Uh, so I would recommend that. The other two things that uh, I want to mention is uh, we have the Yellow King, which is a set of four games uh, that are related, that use a very stripped down uh, mechanical approach for uh, things uh, in terms of the roles and the pushes and things like that. 
but then add to that a layer of complexity with uh, everything being built on condition cards and effect cards and things like that that uh, are played that can can be a challenge especially to manage and run that online uh the uh, the uh call of Cthulhu, sorry the uh the the one-on-one -on -one series for trail of Cthulhu and Knights black agents solo ops also change up the mechanical formula of gumshoe in many ways and while they're still recognizably gumshoe they are doing very different things and they have uh, a whole different set of uh, ideas about uh uh conditions and things uh so let me uh see if i can get some people's questions or comments or thoughts uh, uh especially if you've played and you want to add on to what i've said or uh, uh you want to 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 ask me a particular thing about something let i'd i'd like to open that up if people do have uh some thoughts Shane, I know you and I have had some some conversations about gumshoe uh, uh, and and play and design uh, before on this topic. Thank yeah, I, I mean, I, one thing I would emphasize is like what you were saying about uh, exceptional successes. Like my games got my gumshoe games just got way better after you suggested to me um, offering an extra benefit to someone if they roll four or more above the target number. Because otherwise, you just get people who are like the target number is four. I put in three points. Like rolling dice is fun, so you want to give them a reason to roll the dice and to spend the points, and um, I, I think the game plays a lot better if you do that. Yeah, especially because then you can you can make them spend more. Like, yeah, uh, especially if you describe it as being awesome, people want to do awesome. They want to look awesome, so you want to really lean into that uh, uh, because your player's ego is your best ally as a GM. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, Vince. Oh, no, sorry. I think, Brian, you came off mute before I did. So you go uh, ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not in a big hurry. I'm just kind of curious. Um, I'm wondering if you have any time spent um, mixing and matching the the different sort of gumshoe-based rule set, because I've run uh, Eternal Eyes for Trail of Cthulhu something Ooh. like 1.9 1, 1. times. <laughs> um, and um, one of the things that we've always noticed about that is that in the way the gumshoe rule set is set up, a Tommy gun is functionally equivalent to a pistol. Yeah. You know, it's sort of like a throwback to the first D and D rules where everything does one D six damage. So one of the things I was thinking about doing is moving in some of the rules from like Knights, black agents uh, to sort of uh, spice up combat a little bit. And I was just wondering if you would ever tried any uh, sort of mixing and matching within the sets. Yeah, I definitely with trailer Cthulhu. I'm, I'm, for players, I've really laid out specifically, uh, you know, you're going to get benefits if you if you get a critical success to kind of encourage that spend. But the other thing I've done is try to outline uh, for the investigative spends the, the kinds of things that uh, uh, sort of the Serpentine does, where I say, you know, here are the kinds of, of spend benefits you can get that are not just investigative things like, and because I think we can talk about that generally uh, to players and they'll go, okay, yeah, I could do that. But uh, uh, one, of, one of the good things that sort of Serpentine does is, is it really lays it out. It says, hey, for this investigative ability, here are the things that, that are the cool things that you can do with it uh, outside of that. And and that's something I've tried to do with with, with Trailer Kulu is spell that out more, more specifically. Right. Uh, so yeah, I think there are, are some great great tools from the later games uh, I, here's the thing i'm shocked that trailer cthulhu hasn't gotten a second edition mm -hmm. um we've gotten second editions of Esoterrorist, which was really kind of a, a 1.5 edition uh and uh shockingly to me mutant city blues uh getting a second edition and and making some fairly substantial changes uh so yeah i mean you've run trail so you can kind of see where the creaky bits are right mm -hmm. for sure like what? What else would you say are are the hangups when when you've run it that that are like the friction points for you? You know, for me, it's it's mostly been in action scenes. I've been running enough sort of investigative type things, and uh, you know, I use kind of the same basic premise in Trail as I do in something like Delta Green, which is if you have the skill at a certain point, 
you know, here's here's the information. You can spend points if you want to get more. So the investigative parts of it have worked pretty well for me. It's really just kind of the the action scenes that have mostly been, I won't say problematic, but disappointing. Yeah. From my perspective. I, I, I do think that there's some cool, like, uh, I really like what Knights Black Agent Solo Ops has, those, mm-hmm. those talents. And some of the cherries that they have uh from from nba base i think i think it would be really interesting to sit down with trailer cthulhu and go okay what is a benefit like an interesting in genre benefit that i could give people if they've bought invested x in y yeah i think that could be really dynamite uh uh uh, and i think that could be a, a great a great way to 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 deepen some of those action uh uh sequences uh especially if you're playing in the pulp mode i think mm-hmm. that there there's more room there for that kind of thing sure uh, I've had uh, a, yeah Vince. yeah i was gonna say i've had a couple of things that have, have been challenges for me as a player with uh gumshoe games and i'm wondering you know as as a gm the best ways to address these and control for them uh one of them is is the distinction between being like Poirot and feeling like Poirot, where um, if if players are really flailing with the clues that they have available and getting off track, how do you redirect them toward where the the solution to a mystery is without uh, stealing their agency? Uh, this is a very like a, a general mystery question. Uh, I will say there are there are two things that I would suggest. Uh, one is, uh, as a GM, be obvious, uh, 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 especially when you're just starting out with a group, uh, when you're playing with them, when they're getting used to how you're doing. Uh, the players don't know everything that you know. And as a GM, you're like, oh, I don't want to give this. I don't want to tell them this because that's a little obvious that they'll get that too quickly. Players are working through a couple of layers of they're listening to you they're trying to mediate that through their character's personality they're also listening to the other players so they've got a lot of noise in there so one of the things is to to be obvious but the situation that you're talking about is where players get stuck uh where where they, where they 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 get challenged and one of the things that i try to do uh uh like between at like at the start of sessions or after breaks or when I feel that maybe things have gotten a little bit is I, I go, okay, let's go through what, you know, I, I stop and I restate the information that they have, the facts that they have, the clues that they have, uh, because that gets everybody on the same page. It may get players who are stuck because they've misunderstood something uh, suddenly realizing that they have misheard or they've misunderstood. Uh, players may see where there's a gap more obviously in their knowledge. And plus, because I, as the GM in saying it, it's authoritative. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and I, 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 I don't tell them just everything they need to know. You know, I, I do leave the red herrings in there, but I think it's a really important step to go, okay, let's stop. Let's go through what you know. Uh, what you've established, what you have as 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 clues there. So uh, I think that's really important. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. As I said, the the other question I had was uh, suggestions for bringing in more of the st- uh, storytelling game techniques of shared world building, which I can see as being like a little bit more of a challenge if you have a mystery that has a solution. Like this is not card from Brindlewood where you just have clues. And then mm-hmm. whatever the players decide is the solution they roll for and they find out if they're right. Um, making sure that they have that sense of, of ownership in the setting um, so that it feels lifted. Right. I think at that point that, that that you're still doing the kind of the paint the scene questions and the questions about details and things like that, but you're, you're directed about it. Uh, uh, maybe you're asking questions about the character's own backstory, or maybe you're asking questions about something that uh, is related to what, uh, a, an investigative skill that they've they've sunk points into. 
uh, that 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 you're asking them to paint the scene in a particular way, like uh, like after they found you know and done a forensics thing and and uh, 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 figured out you know some sort of a clue based on the blood splatter in this, uh, you ask them what is it what does it look like when you go and investigate that kind of thing like like are 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 you approaching it like a csi or you know are you down into the, the you know on the on the floor like like asking them to give them a chance to describe their character and uh maybe build build other things up you could ask them about people that they know those are other kinds of of uh, deepening questions uh but you don't don't make those paint the scene things too broadly uh uh so that you don't get trapped in a situation where a player declares something and now you have to go with it uh because when you ask a question to a player like that a scene question as you know it's an implicit promise to the player that you will take seriously what they suggest and you will use the material and the ideas that they suggest uh so yeah i think i think narrowing that down uh, let me come to a question Daniel asked in the comments here. Uh, talked about the challenge of calibrating spends to the length of the mystery so players feel there is a challenge, uh, but that it isn't overwhelming. Uh, how do you help players uh, develop the skill of spending appropriately? Uh, so one of the things is I think the, the place that the players will have the most trouble is figuring out how many points they want to spend on investigative abilities. Because your instinct at the first blush as a player is, I want all the information, so I want to make, you know, a two point or a three point spend, and I try to model and ask players to kind of, uh, you know, say, hey, you only have to spend one, and you're going to get, you know, if you do that, you're going to get awesome information. You don't have to uh, uh, go go fully into that. Uh, on the sort of the general investigative ability side. Uh, uh, if you're doing a mystery, and I would say that an average case for me when I'm running, is, you know, one of those kinds of blocks is probably three sessions, uh, plus or minus a session. And one of the ways that you can help players like have a sense of how much they want to spend is when you come back from the breaks, you go, okay, where are everybody's pools at? How many points do you have? Uh, like we're, we're halfway through the mystery. Where is everybody at? Uh, and kind of signposting those things is a way to kind of get people more used to what's going on and, and have a better sense of how much they should spend. Uh, uh, but it, I, it is a game, I think, that has has some crunch in that in trying to figure those things out. Yeah, thanks for that. I've definitely heard people when they talk about Gumshoe talk about... Um their dislike of the fact that you can make a bunch of spends or whatever and then become basically ineffectual for part of the game like the latter part of the game um and that feels like it is a like a legitimate concern with a game in which you have sort of like a limited pool of resources and no way to refresh those resources yeah. until you know the mystery is over as a gm if you find that players are kind of getting themselves into that particular track, uh, and and Brian may be able to speak to this uh, as well, uh, I find that stressing the idea of converting an investigative spend over into three general abilities points to spend, like that that you're not out of resources, that you've got some other creative ways to go about it. Uh, and uh, some of the gumshoe games suggest having like downtime scenes or ways to, in the middle of investigation, uh, stop and let players take a particular micro refresh. Uh, nice Black Agents in particular has has a, a, a bunch of mechanics for that based on on people's uh, higher uh, levels. But yeah, I, I think there are are some things. Brian, what's been your experience with that? I haven't generally run into that as a problem. I'm not against the idea of doing the conversion. Mm -hmm. um, part of my, I don't know if problem is the right word, but I tend to be a more generous GM with information. So I don't 
often have my players running too desperately until we're getting to sort of the big climactic uh, scenes of the campaign. Um, but, um, you know, no, I think it's, I think it's a solid idea. It's just not something I've had to use before. And, and I would say, uh, 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 that g general skills always feel to me like, like that, those are ones that you could be easier kind of with the refresh. There are more logical things you could talk about in game, uh, yeah. uh, uh break points to get those back, uh, uh, so that you can't keep the pressure on those. Makes sense. Uh, any other questions, comments, thoughts about particular games anybody wants to, to ask about? Uh, Shane, I, I do want to ask you this. Uh, uh, would you run the Yellow King again? Oh, that's a good question and quite a hard question. Um, I think that I've decided that overall, like to me, the strength of Gumshoe, the Gumshoe line is really in the setting material and not so much in the system. So I can definitely see myself running a game again that goes through the four sort of settings of the Yellow King, which is like what, 1890s Paris, a kind of alternative 1940s wartime Europe uh, uh, sort of. I've almost I've forgotten what the settings are. And then there's oh, yeah. one that's like you've just overthrown the Yellow King's Carcosin regime in America, and then you're kind of like basically in the present. Like I thought that 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 collection of settings and the way they're connected was really fun. Um, I can definitely see myself running that set again or running other sort of big gumshoe adventures again, but I probably wouldn't do it in a, an actual gumshoe system. One of the interesting things to me about the Yellow King is that it is it is less like like this is the mystery these are the mysteries that we're solving this is one of the things that i think is a strength of of the gumshoe games trail of cthulhu uh a uh, nice black agents uh ashen stars is there's a clear thing this is the mysteries the kind of mysteries we're going to be solving these are the kinds of stories we're going to be telling the things we have to figure out uh and the game is geared towards that uh, uh, Ashen Stars is about stellar troubleshooters. They have a problem. They have to figure out what the problem is, how they fix it, that kind of thing. Uh, in, in each of those games, there's a real strength that Yellow King is really cool, but it also is, is much more nebulous, uh, 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 about like what the, what the mystery investigation aspects are. Yeah, I mean, that's something you see in like quite a lot of the the bigger campaigns, I think, for gumshoe stuff where, you know, like the Dracula dossier or something like that. It's almost more like a, a toolkit for putting together your own mystery rather than a, a mystery that's organized in a particular way, if mm -hmm. you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, I One uh, of the... Yeah, go on. I was just going to say, because you know this is my favorite thing to complain about, I really struggled with the cards in the Yellow King, um, which is this this system where for every sort of harm that a character might suffer, there's a particular card that outlines the effects and the way that it's cleared. And that was a real struggle for me as someone who mostly likes to improvise during play. Like mm -hmm. I had to have specific cards ready for anything that might come up. So that that was a kind of dynamic that wasn't really fun for me. Uh, uh, it's a challenge I've run uh uh nice black agent solo ops and it kind of is where that and the the uh, trailer through the one-on-one uh because the confidential i think is what that's called uh uh where they have a lot of that in it and i did kind of struggle against that because it's it's conditions it's a piece of information it's resources all of those things are are done in a way that that can be really challenging yeah, I've run some so nice black agent solo ops as well, and my experience was it was great as long as we were running the exact adventures as written in the books. Yeah, like that was cool. But if we wanted to like come up with our own stuff, or if the player like decided something that the the text hadn't anticipated, it was going to be a struggle. Yeah, um, I, I would say uh, Swords of the Serpentine is really interesting because it is a fantasy game and. Uh, it's a little more general about what kinds of problems and what kinds of mysteries are getting solved. I think where it is really strong is where you are envisioning the game first and foremost as a, like the players have problems to solve. We kind of focus on those problems where uh, that's, that's where it's real strength is. 
uh, rather than being, uh, you know, a game of rogues in in a fantasy city. Uh, and I think that for me is what Gumshoe is. Is I think Gumshoe for me is a really strong uh, system for playing out mysteries where we are uh, we're, we're taking them pretty seriously. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure out the pieces. We're trying to put them together uh, in a technical uh, way uh, and, and to make that uh, uh, super fun where where the idea of the mystery and the clues and the path to finding it is is central uh, versus something like Apocalypse Keys and the whole that that whole sort of loose mystery system that Ollie Jeffrey came up with uh, that, uh, uh, you know, you you find the clues and then you kind of tell a story about what it is and you roll to see if that's the right way. That kind of character first investigation versus investigation first with characters. Uh, uh, anything else? Any other questions, thoughts, anyone? Okay. Uh, thank you all for putting up with me uh, talking uh, at length about this. Uh, I know some of you know the system and and have a sense of it. I know I I, I did uh, go over some of that. I do think there's some great. Uh, 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 but I was going to ask how you compare. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 so one of the things is is that uh, I hope this is going to be a resource out there for people who maybe are are looking at Gumshoe uh, to to watch and maybe get some stuff. We're going to be doing some more of these. I hope to do one on the Mutant Engine and uh as well uh 2d20 so uh we'll be looking forward to that i know the next thing we have uh on our agenda for these seminars is uh a session on masks uh with uh, rich rogers and i talking about uh running that uh so thank you all very much i am going to stop the recording <laughs>